this is the this is the second part of the, the three the three subjects. So the three subjects together link and give you a full picture. So we'll still be missing gaps today with some of the things that we'll actually do. So don't worry. So we'll we'll do hashing and digital certificates next week and really show how everything really works works together. But this week what we're going to look at is uh, is, is some is, is some, some some key encryption. So we're going to go into some detail about looking at the, the various methods that, that we have. Uh, we'll dive a little bit into key entropy. So key entropy is all about that I have trillions and trillions of keys, but if I put a password of QWERTY1 on those keys, then I, I really lost the, the, uh, the opportunity to have a, a large key space. So key entropy is all about what is the equivalent key size uh, that, that I have with, with, with my security. So especially when we look at passwords next week, uh, that will become more, more important. Okay, so we're going to look at the, the various types of, of encryption and hopefully uh, we'll be able to uh, start to understand how all these keys are, are, are actually used and hopefully how our digital certificate is, is actually used too. <coughs> okay, so there's, there's what we have. So most people think cryptography is all about secrecy and privacy and really, it, it, it isn't. Uh, encryption is as much about proving integrity and also about proving identity. So increasingly, it's about proving identity. So we look at the, the basic model that we have. So we have Bob, <coughs> Alice, and unfortunately we have Eve in, in the middle. Uh, so how do we make sure that the messages that go from Bob to Alice are private. We'll use what's called secret key, uh, symmetric encryption as we're going to for that. That's the workhorse of, of the industry. Uh, and then we need some sort of uh, proof of identity to prove it really is Bob that's communicating with Alice. And hopefully, vice versa, that Alice can identify themselves to Bob. Uh, the internet we've created typically only has one way authentication, but in a proper internet, then you'll have two-way authentication. Both parties authenticate themselves properly and to each other and continue to authenticate. So just because you've authenticated now doesn't mean that you've still got the same ID in 10 minutes uh, or, or so. So identity is, a, is an important part. That's public key that is core, uh, is core to that. And then when it comes to integrity, well, public key, private key actually come in, uh, in there. So we'll have a look at uh, how each of them are linked together. So as we'll find, uh, really, who do we trust on the internet? Very few. <laughs> there isn't really any core trust built into the internet. So distributed network, who do you really trust? So we've built up this crazy infrastructure called PKI. And the core infrastructure is um, these trusted core, trusted entities. Do you know who they might be? Who's, who's the core trust on the internet? <coughs> root authority. Was it? The root authority. Google? Or the uh, public authority. Authority, yeah. Yes. So some of those are? So the big authorities. Yeah. So the trust authority deal. Okay. So very sign, good idea. Uh, Let's Encrypt, what's so special about Let's Encrypt? Have you heard of that one? It's free. It's a wacky one. <laughs> it's free. It costs you £50 or £50 to create a key pair in an instance. Uh, it's a good business if you can get it. So there are new kids on the block, such as Let's Encrypt, uh, who are generating key pair certificates uh, for us. <coughs> okay, so there's, <coughs> there's the model that, that we have and we'll have a look at what key, uh, PKI actually is. Okay, so for our encryption, what we have is we have a standard algorithm that we use. Uh, we then create a plain text, convert it to ciphertext, send it over, hopefully Eve can't tell what ciphertext is, and then we use a standard algorithm. 
So Eve knows what the algorithm is. She has the software. She can do whatever she wants with it. So we use a key. So the key is how we make sure that it differs its time. <laughs> and as long as it's too difficult for Eve to actually get the key, then hopefully we're, we're secure. So Eve will search through all the keys and she might be lucky, she might get quickly, or it might take her a long time. So the more keys that we have, the more secure the message becomes. So those are the three core methods that we we Symmetric, the purest way to define them is symmetric encryption. That's using the same key on, on either side. So we have a secret key, and the secret key is then used by both uh, Bob and, and, and Alice. Okay, so Bob has a secret key, and in some way he needs to pass that to Alice. Some magic goes on, so Eve is listening to the communications, but we can actually send this key to uh, Alice, and Alice will be able to use the same key. Then we have asymmetric encryption. With asymmetric encryption, Bob and Alice have a key pair. Okay, so this is Alice's digital certificate. Okay, this is the one that she's bought. And you see there are two keys on here. A public key and a private key. And this private key is so special that if anybody gets this, you've lost your, your identity. So when people talk about stealing bitcoins, they don't steal the bitcoins. They don't go onto your computer and grab a whole lot of these coins, and there's, there's a whole lots of files there, and they go on your computer and they snatch them, and somebody's got to go and try and find them. And in a, in a Bitcoin world, it's that thing that's special. If somebody steals your key pair, your, your private key, then you've lost your, 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 your Bitcoins. So this key is so special, really, and it's because it proves your identity, uh, typically. So we have uh, two keys, two keys, a public key and a private key. Uh, public key is like a, like a padlock, really, and can distribute the padlocks to whoever I, I want. And you can use it, you can lock the box, and then only this magic private key will open the box. <coughs> Everybody can have my public key, that's fine. Uh, but it's this private key that actually matters. So what we we'll see is, is the public key is used in tandem with the symmetric key. Uh, symmetric key does the encryption, does, the, does the, the privacy, and the public key is the thing that actually proves uh, the, the identity. And then at the end, we have a one-way hash. And uh, the one-way hash shouldn't be reversed mathematically. But unfortunately, it is through rainbow tables and brute force and standard dictionary type, type attacks. Okay, so so we'll look at each of the different methods uh, for private key address actually two, <coughs> four des yes. Look at public key uh, ISA. And increasingly, we're moving towards uh, what are called elliptic curve uh, methods. So there are two ways to, to keep something, to, to implement a public key method. Uh, one is to use prime numbers, and the other is to use discrete logarithms. And because we're in John Napier's <laughs> castle, then uh, we like discrete logarithms here. So John Napier's legacy lives on, and that's why I put on the slide here. Uh, he lives on in discrete algorithms, and we'll actually have a look at what those are and why it's so difficult for a, a computer to to really crack uh, these. Okay, so as we covered last week, the more bits that we have in our key, the the, uh, <coughs> the more keys that, that we actually have. But don't get fooled by this one, <laughs> because you've got 128 bits encryption doesn't mean that you have 108 the strength of 128 bits. Uh, if you don't use all the encryption keys, 
If you generate it from a password, then it's the amount of passwords that you're using that really determines how many equivalent keys that you actually have. Okay, but about 72 bits is where we are. But every year we lose a bit. Uh, <laughs> we usually lose a bit because computing power kind of doubles each year. So <coughs> just because we're there now doesn't mean we'll be there uh, anytime soon. But if quantum computers come along, then things are going to change uh, drastically. So the way we've generally kept up is to just keep ramping up the key sizes. So we're up at 256 AAS. That should be enough for a long time. Even a quantum computer won't crack on that one. The biggest problem with quantum is that quantum just loves to factorize two numbers together. Uh, and it's public key, and especially at ISA, that's open to, to cracking from, from that up. Okay, so I'll give you a high level introduction. This is what happens when you connect to the internet. When you connect to Google or your Gmail or anything that says HTTPS on it, uh, never go anywhere and the input financial details or anything like that that hasn't got a little padlock that isn't HTTPS uh, in there. But every single time that we connect uh, to a secure uh, web service, this is really what, what happens. Basically, initially, we do a key exchange. So the key exchange will, uh, will eventually generate the key that we're going to use both us and Google, every single time you connect a new session, it creates a brand new key. So if someone managed to crack this key, then they'll have to crack the next one and, and, and so on. So we generate the key using key exchange. We'll go over Diffie Hellman, but these days it's, uh, <coughs> there are other methods used uh, for that elliptic curve Diffie Hellman. As we've seen in the lab, is the one that's, that's typically used uh, these days. The client and server negotiate the crypto that they want. The, the client will say, I really want to do RSA, and I want to do AES, and they'll bind a crypto contract together, because you might not support some of the crypto on one side. And that's caused real problems, because what happens is that the client does a downgrade attack, and the downgrade attack is that it takes the very minimum crypto that's, that's possible, it takes all the weakest methods that are open to attack and gets the, the server to, 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 to do that. So an example was with the, uh, the drone uh, attack, it was possible to push the crypto down so much that the actual client could reverse the private key of the, uh, of, of the server. And then uh, private key is used for our main cryptography, so typically AES these days, but it could be uh, CDES. And then public key is used to prove uh, identities and sometimes to wrap the key uh, securely. So when we connect to Google, we get Google's public key. Uh, Google signs something, as we'll see, and we check that it really was Google that actually sent, sent that. Okay, so the, so the public key and private key are used to prove uh, identities. In, in, in the, okay, so that, those are all the methods that we're going to look at. So let's look first at whether we should use a block or a, a, a stream. So most conventional crypto methods have what's called a cipher block. Okay, basically you take the, the data stream and you, you chunk it up. So you def for the method that you're using, you will define the size of each of the message blocks. And you always deal with that in terms of a byte stream. So uh, it doesn't matter if you deal with text or binary, it becomes a byte stream. So you take, in this case, 120 bits, use a secret key, and then you, you cipher that you start with the next one, uh, and, and then so on. <coughs> well, we always fill all of the, the cipher blocks. Probably not. Probably not. Uh, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> so 
we've got a bit in the end, and we use what's called padding PIDI. If you've got time to do the tutorial, we've got a little Python tutorial, <coughs> and you've got to pad it with nulls, uh, or you've got to pad it with one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, there are various different ways that you pad the end of it, because the other side has got to know that that bit at the end isn't actually any data and shouldn't be appended uh, onto it. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's led to, to many well-known attacks. So the attack on, on the crypto is on the padding that happens at the end of it. Uh, right, so, so we need to decide whether we're using block or, or stream. block is where we take a message box, we, we, we take a chunk at a time, and then we cipher with the secret key, and then we put it all back together as a, as a stream. Uh, the other method that we use is what's called a, a, a stream, a stream cipher. And stream ciphers are still used. Can anybody tell me the advantage of using a stream cipher? over a, a block cipher. So the stream cipher was used in, uh, uh, in web, in, 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 in Wi-Fi. And it actually it was one of the weak, weakest crypto. <laughs> it had virtually every fraud you can imagine. What, what's the advantage of using a stream cipher? as opposed to block cipher. It's faster than block. Faster. It's faster and it's also real time. As the bits come in in a, in a stream cipher, you can decrypt them uh, as, as, as they go in. And you see the advantage here <coughs> is that you have what's called an exclusive OR gate here. The exclusive OR gate is a very simple device. Uh, with RC4, we take a secret key, such as the password. We put it in with a random seat. Do you ever know what a random seat is called? Do you remember doing the web or anything like that? It's an IV. Do you know what IV stands for? It's, a, it's an initialization vector. Initialization vector, as we'll see, is a bit salt. We okay, initialize it. Unfortunately, with web, the IV came round after about eight hours or something like that. You just have to capture the two cipher streams at the time, exclude the them together, and it's possible to reverse the key. And at one time, the key was shared across the whole network, so you could actually crack all of the communications. Luckily, that doesn't happen um, anymore. And we, we use uh, WPA. So with RC4, we take the random seeds and the secret key, and we create a pseudo infinite bit stream. And then we basically just exclude or that with that, and that gives us our stream. So every single bit that comes along is, is actually ciphered that way. So it's still used, it's still used, <coughs> uh, but it's obviously it's, it's not as secure as as, a, as blocks. Okay, so there's a there's the method there. There's an RC4, and it was used in, in web. Uh, we take an initialization vector p generate our infinite key, take our cipher stream, uh, take our data stream, and then that gives us our cipher stream. As we saw last week, that's the exclusive or type function. We take one bit at a time, a zero and a one gives us a one, a zero and a zero gives us a zero, a one and a one gives us a zero. So it's a standard, <coughs> standard uh, method of uh, ciphering. Okay, so let's first look at secret key or a private key. So some of the methods that are around, so DES has been around for, for quite a while, 64 bits. Uh, I say 64 bits encryption key, but it's actually uh, only 56 bits because eight of the bits are, uh, are checked, checked some bits. So as we've seen from before, some two bits is the limit, so we don't ever encrypt anything with DES because it can be cracked uh, e easily. Uh, so 
it's still used in a lot of applications, especially in finance and in, in tunnels. So they created a new method called FreeDes, which does it three times. It has two keys, so two keys gives us 112 bits equivalent. We encrypt with the first key, we decrypt with the second key, and we encrypt again with the first key. Crazy, <laughs> it works. What's the downside of using FreeDes, do you think? Uh, high computational cost. Yeah, so it's got to got to do it three three times, uh, and and uh, so three days is typically just used for compatibility. If you've got to use days, then three days is the one. <coughs> so two fish, actually two bluefish. You'll see them all over the all over the place in in different types of crypto, and uh, there. But the one that won the competition for uh, the, the best cryptography method uh, through a, a NIST competition in 2001. It was peer-reviewed by experts, it was voted on, it went through uh, empirical experiments to see what was the fastest. Uh, I think Blowfish uh, was one of the contenders. Uh, but we ended up with the Ringdao uh, method which is now standard as, as EES. So that's the one that's really used for uh, the, the most robust type of uh, encryption. And it should be fairly secure. Uh, unfortunately, the people who make chips uh, are quite sloppy. So here, I don't know if you've seen uh, the YouTube uh, video, but, but uh, uh, Dr. Owen Lowe here takes an Arduino Listens, listens to the power supply and watches for the little spikes uh, and it, he manages to break 128-bit AES key in 20 minutes. Uh, but watch it online if, you, if, you, if you've got time uh, to do it. But uh, what happens is that because, because of the, there's crypto runs and as it's doing the crypto, the power supply spikes and if you actually analyze the spikes over time, if you take samples of it, you can actually easily reverse engineer. And I actually found, I don't know if you've seen the receptacle, but I'll send it, uh, somebody managed to uh, uh, crack the encryption keys on a mobile phone with an antennae next door. Uh, and these devices leak radio emissions uh, all the time, and you can actually listen to the radio waves that they give off and, and pick off the the, the, the encryption keys. Okay, so that's that's the methods that we use. Uh, there's a whole lot of other ones that are in there too. Okay, so those are the three big contenders: DES, uh, Rindal, AES, and, and uh, RC2 uh, for the main encryption methods. So the problem that we've got is that uh, how how can we how can we the major problem that we, <coughs> that we have is that if I know that Bob sends hello uh, then I can then pick off that and then I have the word for hello and then if he if I now know that he says goodbye, I look at the, the cipher and I can pick off the cipher for that and then I can copy and paste messages together uh, because every single time he ciphers then you'll get the same uh, result from from, from them. <coughs> okay, so there's there's what we have. Uh, so we could do a replay attack, we could Replay the whole message back to Alice if we wanted. We could do copy and paste. Uh, we can bring the ciphers together like that. So the way it's solved is using salt. So we add salt to the encryption uh, process. So this is uh, the, the standard method and it should never be used. And some of the initial ransomware that came out actually had this electronic code book and you could actually see patterns occurring and, and, and it would have been possible to actually decrypt 
the cipher because they've used such poor uh, cryptography. So with the Eltron code book, you take a block, you, you encrypt it, you take each block in turn, which means that every block will be the same. So if I type hello, then I should be able to spot hello coming up. Uh, eventually, if I get somebody to cipher all these, then I can actually determine the encryption key from, from that. <coughs> the way we normally do it is to add salt. And the salt, we now add an initialization vector to it. And it's the initialization vector that gives us our, uh, our uh, changes in the cipher. So one of the methods is called cipher block chaining. Uh, and we'll see when we use OpenSSL today how we can actually define what method we're using. So with cipher block chaining, we take the initialization vector, we exclude the bar, the, the block with it, we apply our encryption key, and then we then take that block and we feed it into the next block, we exclude the bar, our, our block coming in with the first block, and then each time it will actually change uh, the ciphers. So you can see this very well here. Uh, so this is taken from the Wikipedia site. So there's the penguin, and this is using <coughs> top quality AES encryption. Uh, and we can actually still see the penguin. So tell me why we can still see the penguin, even though I've used the best encryption possible. When I look at the cipher for the image, why do I still see the penguin? You've got runs of data that are just the same, big Actually, chunks of the same data. So we've got big chunks of white there, and they're going to be ciphered and, and the same here. There's another big chunk of white, and so on. So the way, the way Im uh, images are, are, are set up is, is of parsed, there's some little pixel blocks. So the same pixel block will come out the same in the other one. <coughs> but if you use CBC, then you actually see it looks like encryption is that it should be completely random and noisy. Uh, so this is the this is the image here using um, CBC. So then to store the salt, if I cipher something and send it to you, I want I want to send you the salt. So you've got the key, that's fine. Do I have to now send you the salt? Do you think that bad? The, if I remember correctly, I think the result was generated from the key or something like that. Yeah, the salt should be random, so anything that's random, yeah. your, your, your key yeah. stroke. It's not in the process of the key generation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a random number that's converted into something. It seems intuitive <coughs> that you would have to send the salt, but that's a, that just gives you another key distribution, probably. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the obvious answer is yes, but the correct answer is probably no. Uh, the answer is yes. You're stuffed if you lose the salt. Uh, are you completely stuffed if you lose the, if you lose the salt? If, you lose, if somebody goes and deletes the salt, is it, is it gone? I've got the key. Uh, I'm a. Is it? Can I never get it back? What do you think? I went and deleted the salt because along with the message, I've got the key. <laughs> If you've got the original message and the encrypted message, is oh, no, some no, way no. of... So, so it's purely, I've encrypted my disk. Right. I've oh, encrypted no, my whole disk. <laughs> I've got, I've got the, the most important presentation ever that I'm going to give. <laughs> and I've got the encryption key and everything's fine. Uh, and it, it's been salted. Am I stuffed <coughs> because I've lost the salt? What do you think? It's not an easy question. <laughs> How could I get around it? I think you have difficult trying to get the data back. I think the salt is not available. 
So say it again. I said there may be difficulty trying it, to it's, make It's difficult, yeah. yeah. But but if if challenged, if you're investigating a really bad crime and you've got the encryption key, you've got the cipher, is it possible and not the salt, is it possible for you to, to get that back? You get it but so I send all the data together because it sorts is to generate the random not randomness of the message, so pieces everything back together may be challenging. Yeah. Yeah, the salt. That's it, but it's possible. So it's possible because if the salt is quite small, then all we have to do is to go through all the different salt values. So the salt value looks like uh, FD12, if it's quite a small salt. So it makes it even more difficult for that, for that, especially when we look at hashing for passwords. The salt must always be contained within sites, or alongside the hash value. So don't ever run uh, passwords and structures without ever salting. But if you lose the salt, then it is possible to recover it. But it depends the length of the salt and the size of the initialization vector. I think for web that was 24 bits. So it's not going to take you that long to whip through all the 24 bits to actually find it. Which means that a, a, an attacker might be able to determine that the salt that was actually used. So how does sender and receiver agree on the salt value? Uh, so whoever generates the key, uh, or whoever generates, so who, I don't know, whoever generates the cipher uh, text will generate the salt at the same time. They will send the cipher text and the salt uh, to the other side. So it's whoever creates the cipher is the one that creates the salt. Uh, in the lab today, we'll look at the salt that we create. <coughs> so the other, the other uh, thing that we have. The other problem we have now is that how, if we're using we're using a secret key, how do we get a key from Bob to, to Alice? Okay, so that's the how do they how can we get that communication to happen to make sure that Eve doesn't end up with the secret secret key. So that was solved by this guy here. He was the chief technical architect for Sun Microsystems. It's quite a while, but this is uh, Whitfield Diff Diffie. So Whitfield Diffie uh, proposed that there might be a trapdoor function, and a trapdoor function is that uh, we might be able to create two keys together that are special. We use one, and then we use the other one. So he proposed that that was, was, was possible. Ralph Merkel, an undergraduate student, uh, actually drafted the methodology and have a look at the feedback from his tutor. <laughs> so it just shows you that the professors aren't always right. Uh, the, the, uh, the feedback was, it's not, it's not really a very good idea. You really go back and think about it. I like the other idea that you had uh, for this. He then submitted it as a research paper and it was rejected because it didn't have any references. It didn't have any references because there wasn't anything else to reference. It was kind of brand new. <laughs> it got knocked back. So <laughs> you put in references in a research paper because it's, so if you put in references, you've probably got it accepted. It's like a mechanistic thing. The reviewer sees that you don't have any references, so it must be a bad paper. So. Uh, he eventually got his PhD uh, from it. But uh, what Phil Biffy created the Diffie Hellman uh, method, which was a way that we could actually, Bob and Alice could communicate quite openly uh, and pass some <coughs> numbers to each other, and Eve couldn't work out where it. It's highly hackable, <laughs> okay, so don't go anywhere near the core Diffie Hellman method. Uh, but we'll use it as an example of, uh, of how it actually uh, works in memory. Now we use elliptic curve to the element. It's a, it's a bit stronger, a lot stronger. And the way it works, uh, because we're in John Napier's uh, castle, uh, the way it works is through logarithms. So if you remember logarithms from school, now if you've got e to the power of x times e to the power of y, that gives you e to the power of x plus y. 
If you've got e to the power of x to the power of y, that gives you e to the power of x, y. <laughs> Does that, do you remember that? So, so 5 squared times 5 cubed is equivalent to... 5 to the 5. 5 to the 5, yeah. So 5 uh, squared uh, to the power of 3 gives you... Five to, the six. Five to the power of 6, okay? So that's how logs work. <laughs> so the way the Diffie-Hellman works <coughs> is that we generate a couple of random values, x and y, uh, we agree on the number a, then Bob calculates a to the power of x, and uh, Alice calculates a to the power of y. We're using big numbers here, these values are absolutely massive. We then exchange the, the values, uh, and hopefully from there we can generate a, a key. So how it works is that Bob raises his value that he gets to the power of x, and Alice does the same. She raises the value she got from Bob to the power of y. And tell me what happens next. <coughs> so what, what can you say about it, the two values that have resulted? They should be the same. They yeah. should be the same. So it should be x a to the power of x y. Be exact same. There's one little thing that we do different, and that we take the mod of n, and n is a prime number. So, so what only difference here is just kind of illustrates it. But we take a mod n, and it's a prime number, and everything is fine. And the difficulty here is it's really difficult for 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 Eve to determine what x was and what y was from that calculation. Okay, so there's the, there's the process that we go through, and we've got a little online calculator to take you through these values. But basically, we have a G value and an, an, an N value. So the N value is, is the prime number in there. So if we have a look at a real life example, I'm just going to generate some, some random values there. So there's G, and hopefully N is a prime number. There we go. So we'll generate an X and a Y value. <coughs> so Bob is generated 7, Alan is 10. We take uh, Bob calculates 7 to the, uh, the G value. Let's see up there. G value 197 to the power of X and then takes the mod here, gets that value, and Alice does the same with hers, and then they exchange the values. Okay, they send those values uh, over from there. So let's see them generating that, and then hopefully <laughs> at the end, uh, Bob takes that value from Alice, raises it to the power of his x, and mod n, and gets 91, and Alice is the same, and, and it matches. Okay. And the biggest problem for Eve is there are so many values that fit, thanks to Joe Napier, <laughs> there are so many values that fit for X, and it's almost an infinite space, and it's really quite difficult for him to, to, to do that. When quantum computers come along, then that might not be the case, but just now discrete logarithms are really difficult for for computers to, to crack. So I'll just show you what a real one looks like. Okay, so that's, as I said, we use big integers. So there's a value of g, there's a, a, a prime number in there, of that value, uh, x and y are here, there's box value, analysis, and then in the end, we should end up with the same uh, value from, from there. So that's the core of, of Diffie-Hellman and how it actually uh, 
and then and it actually works. <coughs> uh, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, and it's always an unfortunate encryption. It's almost an unfortunate. Uh, the the cryptography works really well as long as there's no problems in it and people don't make mistakes and, and, and so on. And the problem with Diffie Hellman is the, is the Eve in the middle or the man in the middle. <coughs> so Eve just sits in the middle, she negotiates two keys on either side, she creates two tunnels, uh, one with Bob and then another with, with Alice, so she becomes the, the, the man in the middle. And that's the... <coughs> That's probably the biggest uh, weakness of uh, of Gibby Hellman is the that opportunity for Eve to get uh, in between the, the, the communication. <coughs> so let's look at, uh, at public key, and we'll try and understand really what public key is all about. But basically, at its core, it uses two two prime numbers, and the strength of those prime numbers really uh, determines uh, how crackable it, it, it is. So typically these days it's about 1024 bits is, is the length of the numbers. Uh, there are systems around that are searching for every prime number they can get. The latest one they found is absolutely massive. So we're finding more and more prime numbers uh, and but the difficulty for a computer is when we multiply the numbers together, and this is a value called 5, and it's really difficult <coughs> to determine the original prime numbers from, from there. It is possible, uh, and for smallish prime numbers, it's, it can be quite easy to, to, to break it. There's these guys here that came up with a core core methods that uh, what field if they proposed was possible. They came up with a trapdoor method that allowed uh, <coughs> us to create two keys that, uh, that we didn't need to do the, the key exchange uh, in, anymore. And they solved that in 1977. Right, <laughs> you won't get this uh, as I say it. And I want you to go away and I want you to bang your head against the wall quite a lot and try and understand uh, the process here. You will get it, hopefully, maybe 10 years time, you're at a conference or something like that, you go, ah, oh, God, okay. <coughs> the worst thing with this is there's a bit of choosing, okay, and all of that, you, you don't like that in test questions, what I have to choose, a value, I just, I think of a value here, <laughs> that's what you basically do. But what value? Choose, choose one. It will work. Okay, that, that's the problem with it. <coughs> so I'm going to go through it, and 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 you'll probably not get it. Uh, but but please please stick with it, uh, and you'll have to understand it anyway for the first test. So I advise you to to, to know. <coughs> so we start with with two prime numbers, P and Q. Tell me a prime number. What's your favourite prime number? My favourite prime number is two because it's the only even prime number. It's the shortest book in the world. Go. <laughs> shortest book in the world is the even prime numbers. It's got two on it and it says the end. Sorry for that. What's your favourite prime number? I bet I can guess it. 13. Who's this 13? Good. Guess it. Uh, I feel a seven coming on. Seven, 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 two, three, four. Anyone? I don't know your password, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there a seventeen in the audience? Probably not. Well, there is. So, <laughs> so everybody got their own favorite prime numbers. Which, uh, it's really quite sad, I suppose. <laughs> so we're kind of we're kind of geeks anyway. So, so we have that. <coughs> right. So we generate two prime numbers, and they are not thing and and all them. And you wouldn't believe the number of systems that have been set up with that to uh, poor numbers. And we multiply them together and we call that N. Okay? N is part of your private key and your public key. When I tell you my public key, I say my public key is E comma N. Okay? I'm giving away N. Okay? So it's not a big secret. 
it's not a big secret. You can go and hack it in if you want. Hopefully you'll never be able to find those original prime numbers in there. So that's hopefully okay. <coughs> Uh, my decryption key is D comma N. So we can then calculate a value called phi, that's P minus 1 and Q minus 1 multiplied together. So in this case it's 20. And then we select a value of E where we have a greater common denominator of, the greatest common denominator of 1. Uh, okay, so this is, this is where students get a bit confused. You have to choose something here. So tell me what the factors of 20 are. Five, four, two, ten. Don't choose them. Okay. <laughs> Don't choose them. <coughs> so now we can choose anything else apart from, from them. So go on. Apart from uh that doesn't tell you there. So choose one. This is difficult, isn't it? <laughs> go on, choose one that, that isn't a factor of twenty. <coughs> Seven. Seven. Well done. That's it. That's so seven, that's it. So seven is now <coughs> our encryption key. Seven comma thirty-three is an encryption key. Okay, so that's the first part of it. And then we get a kind of crazy part. Uh, crazy part. Crazy part next. And the crazy part next is that D times E uh, mod n gives us 1. Uh, d times e, d times e mod n gives us, gives us 1. And so, so just let me, let me pull up uh, an example here. To talk you through that. Okay, so we need to now find a value <coughs> So in this case, I've selected three, not seven, sorry. Uh, we need to find a value for D to make the encryption key, the kind of decryption key mod of this uh, phi number equal to one. So tell, <coughs> the value that would fit there is seven. Does anybody see that? C times seven is 21, and then mod 20 gives us one. Uh, so we need to find a value that will fit this here to make that 21, to make that one more than, than that from, from there. <coughs> okay, so you want to probably get it straight away, but my encryption key is 333 and 733. So that's, that's what, 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 I, what I said. And then the most evil piece of mathematics ever known to mankind comes next. <laughs> So this is either the most beautiful piece of maths that's ever been created, or the most evil. <coughs> so <coughs> the core of the encryption happens here. So we take the message, we raise it to the power of the encryption key, and we take it to the mod n. That gives us our cipher. <coughs> then to decrypt it, we take the cipher, we raise it to the power of d, and we take mod n and we get the result back here. <laughs> the most ma and it's amazing the beauty uh, of, of that. Uh, but that, that is the core of, of our security, that, that raising uh, our values to the power of an encryption key and then the, the mod n. So those two, those two equations there and uh, really the core of, of, our, of our encryption process. And if they're, if, if they're cracked, then, then we've all got problems. So I've got, I've got a whole lot of examples that you can have a look at. So I've went through a lot of examples that you can try in your own time. But I've also got a calculator to talk you through uh, the basic steps are actually involved <coughs> and you can even put in your own values uh, and hopefully <coughs> it'll work for you. you can select your own P's and Q. So uh, what did you say seven and seventeen? We'll try that one. Seventeen. 
17. And we go to the seven, <coughs> 17. This is and that gives us five. And we choose a, a number that doesn't share any factors with, with, with that, that one. We then generate D based on this D times N mods at five is one. It gives us that. That gives us our two keys there. And then, hopefully, when we generate a message and we encrypt it and decrypt it, it's synced. Okay? So it's, it's really nice that you actually know if you're right because if you go through it all and you end up with the same uh, message as you had originally, then you know it actually works. Does anybody have any questions about that just now? It really, you really need to go away and have a think and, and try a few examples and you won't get it for a while, but hopefully you will get it uh, eventually. Okay, so that's, that's the core of, uh, of, of RSA and what RSA actually does. Right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to take you through uh, how you prove identity <coughs> and how public key uh, keeps things uh, secret. So what I've got here, <coughs> if you look at it, I've got uh, a couple of keys for, for, for Bob and Alice. So as we'll look at, uh, when, when you generate a certificate, you get a key pair, a public key and a private key, and you never let that, uh, you never let anyone externally get access to this this key pair. So what you distribute is a, is a, is a public key. And it's this public key which will prove your uh, I identity. So we'll go through the basic steps that, that, are, that, are, that are actually involved <laughs> in the... Uh, in, in, in encryption. Okay, so there's there's the there's the starting point uh, that, that that we have. <coughs> so I'm going to take you through the basic steps uh, as to as to how uh, Bob can send something something to Alice. <coughs> so the first thing we need is an Alice. So who wants to be Alice? Who wants to be Alice? Do you want to be Alice? You be Alice. There you go. So you have a you have a public and a private key there, and I'll be Bob. I'll be Bob. Okay, so you have a certificate and you have your your certificate there. So you need to hide your private key. You need to stick that under there. So and you need to hide that one too. And you can keep that one. <laughs> okay, so you have a public key and then I have a public and, and, a, and, a, and a private key. So the first thing that, that, that we do with this is that we actually take our message and we take a we take a hash of it. So, uh, do you have a pen? You have a pen. <laughs> Great. Okay. So we'll take our message, and you can write any message that you want on that, sir. <laughs> <laughs> write a message. Don't let me see. <coughs> it's just a short message. It doesn't have to be a long message. <laughs> So can you remember how many characters he used in that in that message? <laughs> See, that's what happens when you have a long message. Twelve. Is it? What is it? Ten? Twelve? We'll find out eventually. So just just estimate it just now. <coughs> okay. Six. Six. You just you took that long to count up to six. <laughs> okay. So so we have six. Okay. This is normally a hash a hash uh, value that, that I've got. So, so I take the message and I take a hash of it. In this case, we're just using a very simple hash. So I, uh, I take my boxes here and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to encrypt, I'm going to encrypt this. I'll come back onto this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my, my, my private key to, to encrypt this little box. And we'll see how that <coughs> works. Uh, uh, later, 
Okay, so I'm just going to take that little hash value and I'm going to encrypt it. See, see, no expense was spared in the setup of the experiment. <laughs> I have a color laser printer at home and tins. You get these tins from IKEA, by the way. <laughs> Downstairs in IKEA, 30 pounds. Uh, I did, uh, I did uh, once do a presentation down in London where I, I, I was to give a presentation about cryptography to the FSA and I took my tins with me <laughs> <laughs> and I took my tape. I actually had a DEB radio, I promise, in, in my bag and as I was going through uh, security, they go, uh, <laughs> come over here, <laughs> go, could you take what's in your bag out of your bag? And, and I had these tins that stacked up like this. And I said, sir, could you just, could you now open the tin, please? I go, okay. okay. <laughs> 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 and sir, could you now just take what's inside the tin? Or could you just put it on the table? And I could just see the CCTV cameras all starting to point towards me. And then the <laughs> uncocking of the, the machine guns. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shaking by this point. I got that. Uh, yeah, and I took, I took this tin out and I put it on the table, and you can see that we're getting quite wet. So, sir, could you now open up that tin and, and put what the contents of that? I'm shaking. I took that, I took that, <laughs> that one out, and I said, sir, could you now? <laughs> no, we're really getting quite upset by this time. Now, sir, could you actually take what <laughs> that tin and open up? And it eventually opened up, and it was tape that was inside it, and I had to explain the whole presentation, and I think they got, <laughs> s they got so bored, <laughs> get, get, the guy, get the guy out of here. So, so I have problems when I go through uh, security, <laughs> now I, I always get stopped at security, and I think it's probably a historical uh, thing. Okay, so you can get these, these tins in IKEA if you want. So if what I've done is I've taken my private key and then I've encrypted this little uh, hash value uh, of, of it. So without looking at the message, I take the message, I put it into the box and I put it along with, uh, with, the <coughs> with the encrypted hash that I've got. So now I'm sending this to Alice, which key should I now use to <coughs> for her to be able to uh, decrypt it? Okay, you've got a choice. There's my private key. You're not allowed to see that. Put that to there. Then my public key. Uh, you've got public key, private key. Which key should I use to encrypt this? What is it? Public public Alice's public key. Yeah, so well, <laughs> well done. <laughs> It was the wrong answer because normally I get the, the wrong answer and I can explain why not. <laughs> okay, so, so let, let's, let's go through a, a, another scenario. So tell me another scenario that's possible that, uh, that, 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 doesn't in, that doesn't involve Alice's public key. You said public key, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. So tell me another scenario that would work. Bob's private key that works, okay. Bob's private key I encrypt with my private with my private key, and then I give it to Alice. And then what key will she use to decrypt it? Yeah. So that works, isn't that great? Oh, so what? Tell me the problem with that. Yeah. So anybody can. And in fact, I can I can get the message back, <coughs> and I can still look at it. <coughs> so what we need is Alice's Alice's private public public key. Okay, she gives me that with the certificate. To, okay, so she she sends me this, and she's got our public key on there. So then we decrypt, we encrypt with our public key. <coughs> There, yeah, so that's red, and uh, it's not so easy. <laughs> okay, so we encrypt that with a public key. Okay, so it's really secure. This is electrical tape, so nobody's going to be cracking this one anytime soon. <laughs> okay, so then uh, we send that to, to, to Alice. Alice gets it there. There you go. 
So tell me which key she'll now use to be able to decrypt the, the private key. Her private key. Okay, get your private key out. <coughs> Don't show anybody. <laughs> okay, tap it. <laughs> no, tap. No, just rest it. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. No, no, your hands. The tin. <laughs> Tap, 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 that's it. Okay, now take, now take the, the, the tape off. <laughs> no, it's not your hand. No. <laughs> okay, and now open the box. Okay then, so I didn't, I didn't read your message at all, sir. No, I didn't. <laughs> so take the message out <coughs> and uh, I just, there should be a message in there, I think. Is there? Is there a message in there? So the message says, is it is it written on? It's a bit difficult to read. What does it say? Banana. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I mean, talk about picking a difficult, difficult. What a difficult. <laughs> okay, so that's banana. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> So now, now we have a, a little box there. So this last little box, what key is going to open up that one? Show the box to everybody. <coughs> Which key is going to open that one? There's, there's, what is it? Bob's public key, okay. So Bob's public key <coughs> and then Bob's certificate with his public key, he'll then pass to Alice and then if you just tap the tap the key on the top, not your hands this time, but the <laughs> just tap it, <coughs> tap it, that's it, yeah, a bit more effort into it, <laughs> and then take the tape off, and I reckon that that is, uh, is, is Banana Got Six Letters, <laughs> is Banana Got Six Letters, I think probably, yeah, so that's his six. So if that ties up, tell me, tell me what that does. What does that final six for banana do, <laughs> really? Integrity. integrity, well done, excellent. What, what do you mean by integrity? It was sent by you. Oh, oh yeah, let's forget about that. <laughs> uh, it wasn't hampered. It wasn't hampered, yeah. And then the, your second thing was that you prove my identity. Yes. Okay, so, so that's, that's the way that it works. That's the way, that's why if you use your, lose your private key for your bitcoins, uh, then you've lost all your, your keys because you've lost your, your identity. Okay, so here it is. There's the certificate going over. Uh, so there's the, uh, Bob encrypts with his private key there. The hash of the message his signature, uh, he then encrypts with Alice's public key, she sends it over, <coughs> she uses her private key to decrypt, she then gets a hash and a message, uh, an encrypted hash, she then uses Bob's public key to then decrypt the message, the hash, the he decrypt the hash, and if they check, then everything's fine. So I'll take you through uh, a real example here, and we use MD5 as a hash, or we use SHA. We'll find out next week what those are, okay? So basically, uh, we take a, a hash, we encrypt the hash with uh, Bob's private key. We then use Alice's public key to encrypt that whole message. Then goes over, uh, and then we end up, she uses a private key to decrypt. We end up with the message, she reads the message. She now decrypts the encrypted MD5, and then she does her own check of the message after the tally. As you said, then we've proven both Bob's identity and we've proven that the message hasn't actually been uh, changed. So in this way, we can actually secure things. There's a few other little things, uh, if you're interested. Uh, normal encryption requires you to encrypt with one key encrypt with another key, you've got to decrypt with the key that you just applied and then decrypt again. There's a new crypto method called cumulative encryption which allows you to add your keys on and for them to 
take the keys off uh, in any order that, 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 that you want. Uh, so this method allows you to be able to really lock the message for all the entities who are involved and then for them to take the encryption off uh, one, one, one at a time <coughs> from, from there. Okay, so uh, uh, that was our logs that, that we showed uh, before. There's the, there's the log methods. I'm trying to find where we are. So there's an encryption method. Uh, so that's taken us through our Diffie-Hellman. Uh, <coughs> so the process that we looked at before to, to cipher was this process where we take our encryption key and we take a prime number and then we create our, our cipher. The big problem for Eve is the difficulty in finding out the value of, of x from that uh, in, in there. Because there are so many solutions for x that would actually give us that an answer there. So the core security of this is is that method <coughs> there? Okay, so let's run that. Okay, and it's it's unbelievable that that after forty odd years, uh, we still cannot verify that the email that we receive was actually sent by the person who sent it. So you'll get phishing emails. Uh, I got one the other day from 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 uh, Apple. Let's say it was from Apple, and it was a Netflix subscription. And I, I kind of panicked until I seen when I rolled over the the link that it certainly didn't go to to Apple. When I did go to the link, because I do do that, <laughs> I did go to the link. Uh, it took me to a page that had been scraped from Apple, uh, but they had forgot to they had used the word password instead of password, which kind of gave the game. Uh, away, but if you looked at the HTML tags, you actually found that the post didn't go to Apple; it went to their server. And people are tricked because they think that if they've got a Netflix subscription, then something's went wrong, and they've just been a uh, no panic uh, generally. So it's unbelievable that in the 21st century, in the cyber age, we cannot verify the contents of an email message and then who actually sent it. And also, if somebody gets access to our Exchange post office, they can hack every single message that's, that's on that. Uh, so really, we need to move away from that and more towards proving identity. And this guy here nearly went to prison <coughs> because of that. So he said that uh, this is a crazy world, that I can't tell the identity of someone who sends me an, an email, and also, uh, how, do, how can we secure the message so that only the person who reads it uh, is, is the one who will read it? <coughs> so the way it's done, uh, this is, do you know anybody who that is? This is Bill Buchanan. What was that? This is Bill Buchanan. This is Bill Buchanan. That's, <laughs> that's not me. Well done. <laughs> Banana. <laughs> I'll check. It's got six letters. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Has it got six letters, is it? I can't think. Yeah, it's not easy, <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, well spotted. That's not me. Okay, <laughs> that's not me. That's not me. I don't have a beard. I've got glasses. I don't fold my arms and things like that in that way. Do you know anybody who, <laughs> who that is? He's a hero or he's a he's a sinner. Uh, it depends where you, where where you work for. <laughs> who is it? Uh, like uh, Bob Dylan. Like Bob Dylan. What's Bob Dylan's real name? <laughs> Zinnemann. Well done. That is, it's not Bob Dylan, it's uh, Phil Zinnemann. Okay. So he invented or created the PGP, which is pretty good privacy. <coughs> and it's the only show in town, roughly, <laughs> but it's a nightmare. You end up with a key ring and so on. I don't know if you've ever dealt with PGP. Has anybody ever sent an email to anybody with PGP? Well done, good. I'll send you my, p my public key tonight and then you can send me an email, okay? In fact, I'll give you all a challenge. I'm gonna send you an email and you're gonna have to decrypt it through PGP. So that, there you go. <laughs> It'll be a secret test question. <laughs> if you don't decrypt it, then, you, then you're gonna be at a disadvantage. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so he came up with a method called PGP and I'm gonna talk you through 
uh, how that actually works uh, from, from them. <coughs> just, uh, if I can just get this, this to, to go. Just doesn't want to, doesn't want to go on to the next one. Sorry, that's. Hmm. Is that because it's got to the end? Yeah, that's that's because it's got to the end. That's that's why it's that's why it's stopping. Uh, so, so I, I I'll talk you through the method. Uh, I, I've I've got a, an outline of it online if you want to, to have a look at it. But uh, basically, what 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 happens is that. Uh, is that is that uh, Bob creates a new uh, encryption key, so he's going to use symmetric encryption. Uh, so what he does is he takes Alice's uh, Alice's pu public Alice's uh, public key, uh, and then will encrypt the key he's used to to encrypt the email and the, his his signature and will only encrypt the key with her public key. <laughs> so he's using standard symmetric encryption, AES, say, to encrypt the message, and his hashed is signature, and then he encrypts that with AES, and he's created a new key. He then takes Alice's public key and then encrypts with her public key only, and then sends it as a zip file. So tell me why he did that. Why didn't he go the whole hog and just do what we did before? Then I would see the difference in w what I said there. He's only taken the key and encrypting it with with uh, Alice's public key. <coughs> why does he do that? Why does he do that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but he could have just encrypted the whole of the message with her public key and that that would have worked too, just as we did before. <coughs> but all he's doing is encrypting this key that he's used to encrypt the message. What's the, what, what's the downside of, of RSA, do you think? What, what's, why do people not use RSA? Because it, it just seems too good to be true. Yeah, we know the the downside of of RSA. It's extremely slow. So to generate a key will take you seconds, and it's it's just too slow. So why did Phil Zinnemann encrypt uh, the key that Bob created with 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 the public key from Alice? That's right, yeah, yeah. So if you're taking a whole movie, <laughs> then it's you're not going to be able to take a massive movie and to be able to uh, use public key uh, on that. If you look at the mass, remember we did that to the power of X, <laughs> you're not going to take a whole big block number and do that. So this method is used typically now uh, on whenever we connect to Google. Uh, often we create a new encryption key we take Google's public key, we encrypt that new key that we've got, we send it back to Google, and then Google uses their private key to be able to, to decrypt the key that we're going to use. Okay, so that that's uh, an advancement that that he that he set up uh, for, for 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 encryption. Okay, so so we'll, we'll have a look at that in, in more detail uh, when we look at uh, we when we when we look at that later. Uh, yeah. Right. So what what I've set up for the module is uh, you should find that there's a there's a page set up for you to review what we what we did today. So in the lab today what we'll do is we'll go over uh, OpenSSL open 
Uh, do you know what, what problem OpenSSL caused in the industry? <coughs> so OpenSSL is the standard uh, tool that we use to, to for, for our encryption to do hashing and, and public and pri private keys. Do you know what problem OpenSSL caused? It was probably the biggest problem ever in security. do with this? Heartbleed, yeah. So there was a, there was a little bug in the code. Uh, it caused a buffer underflow. A buffer underflow is that when you try to fill an area of memory with data that doesn't actually exist, <coughs> and then you lift it back again, you actually pull back whatever was in the memory uh, of the running server, which meant that any encryption keys, any passwords that were sitting in memory were, were lifted. So someone just had to send one packet to a server and it would lift the running content of, of the memory and that was all caused by C++. <laughs> Typically, if you've ever looked at C++ code, it's, it's a nightmare uh, when, when, <coughs> when you looked at it. So we've outlined uh, some, some questions there, uh, but you should find on the main site that we've set up a whole lot of uh, examples for you to use. from here. Okay, so if you want to have a look at any of the methods that we've been that we've been looking at, uh, then you should find there is a, there's material uh, there for each of the, the different types. Generally, we've moved away from using C Sharp in Java towards uh, Python, uh, especially because there are just some, I mean, at its core, it's C++. So the original code is typically in C++, but you'll get some sort of port uh, on, onto Python. So I strongly advise you to get into Python, uh, or at least to get into OpenSSL, uh, because there are, are some things that you really just can't do without uh, integrating the, the, the code. So in the lab today, we've got both the OpenSSL tutorial that you'll do, but also there's a little Python uh, uh, tutorial that you can do in, 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 in your own time. <coughs> Does anybody have any, any questions at all in what we've, what we've actually uh, uh, done uh, at all? Uh, well, what I'll do is uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just make a start on, on, hash <coughs> on hashing. And it's in there. Okay. So I'll give you a little introduction to, to hashing methods and we'll we'll, we'll continue it uh, next next week. Okay, so this is the this is the third part of our of our of our crypto, and it's looking at all the different uh, hashing types. One thing that we'll actually find is that uh, that that it's actually quite difficult to properly protect passwords uh, using using hashing methods, and we should find that slow is better. <laughs> A snail in hashing is actually better than a really fast hashing method. So if you see when there's been a hack, if someone is using bcrypt, uh, then you know that they're putting some thought into the, the way that they're hashing the, the, the passwords. Uh, so with hashing, uh, we'll see that uh, it can be not too difficult for somebody to, to reverse our, 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 our fingerprint. So again, it was, it was Ron that, that developed uh, some of the standards in, in hashing. So it's really to take a fingerprint for any data that we have, one bit of data or a whole network or of, of, of any, any size of data 
we end up with, with the, typically with the same uh, fingerprint uh, size. So MD5 was used for a, for a while, and MD5 looks like this. It's 128 bits. So 128 bits translates to how many characters for hex? 128 bits, how many characters should we get? Thirty-two, so it should be thirty-two uh, there. So we either represent it in our hex or in our base uh, sixty-four uh, there. Unfortunately, uh, somebody found that you could get a collision, uh, and recently, uh, our, our researcher in the U.S. took two images, James Brown and uh, Barry White, and gave it to the GPUs in the Amazon cloud, and then what's called a a birthday attack. We'll do the birthday attack next week. Well, we might do it just now. But with the birthday attack, if you keep randomly uh, adding bytes, eventually you'll actually come up with the same hash signature. So within a day, he managed to stuff <laughs> the images. So they ended up with the same MD5 uh, signature. He's now managed to do it with three images uh, and uh, ended up, took three images with the same uh, hash signature, which is really difficult from a legal point of view because somebody can in a defence in court say, you thought I looked at that picture? Actually, I looked at Barry White. And look, there's the same hash. If you took MD5, but they're still using the MD5, you wouldn't believe it, they're still using MD5 in, in law enforcement. But really, we need to move away uh, from, from that. So a better one is 160, what's SHA-1. And then we have SHA-256. SHA-384 and SHA-512. You can't, th now they're saying for the digital certificates that that's now gone because there's a possibility <laughs> of, a, of a collision that two different data values could end up with the same uh, SHA-1 uh, signature. Okay, so SHA-1 is, is better from there. But they're kind of worried that it's going to be cracked. So they had a competition and we now have SHA-2 and now SHA-3. SHA-3 uses a completely different way of hashing than SHA-1. So just in case in the future SHA-1 is cracked, uh, then we've got SHA-3 sitting in there. But it's likely that SHA-3 will become a standard quite soon. Okay, so basically just if we just change even one bit of data, it will completely change the hash, which isn't actually great from an investigation point of view because if somebody changes one bit in an image then it's going to change the, the, the whole of the hash signature. So there's research work going on to what's called similarity hashing methods where if I just change a little bit in a document say then the hash looks kind of the same but I can tell what's actually changed from it. But there are static ones look like that and will generally change. <coughs> and it's OpenSSL that we typically look to to be able to create our, our hashes, and we'll do that in the lab today. So this is creating our, our, our hash value uh, for us then. So we typically do it in operating systems for files where we'll take uh, our files, we'll take a hash of them, and then to prove the identity of all our files, we just keep checking the hash value. So something like Tripwire will have a whole list of hash values and then whenever a file changes, it checks that against the hash value and we'll, we'll see if the, and we'll know if the file has actually been changed. And we see it in certificates. So you see there's a thumbprint in there. And in this case, we have a SHA uh, thumbprint. And the thumbprint is really defining the whole of the certificate. And when we check the hash thump thumbprint, it should tally up with the whole of the, uh, the, the certificate. So we see it uh, in Windows passwords. So we have uh, uh, MD4 uh, as and NT, 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 uh, MT passwords. And this is stored in the, in the, uh, the Windows registry. And we see also in, in, uh, in Cisco configs so here, here we actually see a, an MD5 
password is. We'll find out that value there gives us an indication as to what the hashing method uh, is that, that we're actually using. And the one thing to notice from here that will go on to is it's lacking another little, it's, it's, it's this value here is the salt value. So the dollars are significant in it. The first dollar identifies the hashing method that we're using. The second dollar identifies the salt, as we talked about, because we also salt our hashing values. Uh, and then the last value is the actual hash value. Uh, so you, you kind of worry when, when you see this in your config that somebody could take this and actually crack the, the, the password for the system. So they're, they're cracked, as you may already know, using uh, either a dictionary attack where we take common words and then we just go through and we, we pre-cook them for the hash value or it could be attacked from a rainbow table where we've already got these tables uh, made up uh, with all the most common passwords and we all we have to do is to go down the table and find the value that matches and then we can link back to the original password. So though the hashed value, hashing method can't be cracked for its mathematics, through a rainbow table and a dictionary attack we can all, all, all we also easily uh, crack them. And it happened with the Adobe hack. So the Adobe hack, 150 million accounts were compromised and nearly 2 million people selected the password of 123456. So given the opportunity to go for a six digit password, the majority, the largest percentage of the people will select 123456 closely followed by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, they'll never think of this one, 7, 8. Ah, they'll think we'll go to 9. So uh, over 200,000 people selected 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And the one thing to notice is that uh, Adobe didn't use salt, as we'll find out. So once the ciphertext is broken, once, then all of the 2 million people who selected uh, one, two, three, four, five, six is now actually revealed. And then obviously what happens is that they, they, they go on and if you can hack one account, people will typically uh, use the same password for all their accounts. So if, they've, if it's been breached for one, they'll jump on to other accounts uh, from, from, from them. Okay, so a key or an important part of this is the basic strength of, uh, of our passwords. So if I've got a seven-digit password, and if you use regular expressions, you'll notice what that says. That's anything from an A to a Z, lowercase. So how would I calculate the total number of passwords that are possible? I've got a seven-digit password. I can only use A to Z, lowercase. How many passwords do I have? 26 to the power <coughs> of 7. <coughs> if I've got a 7 digit password, now A to Z, and big, that should be a big A to Z there. How many passwords have I got now? 52 to the power of 7. And now, make it a bit more difficult, uh, I've got A to Z, big A to Z, and I can actually add in squiggly characters and things like that. So how many passwords have I got now? 60, 62? We'll approximate that to the south. Okay, so now you get these hash crackers. Uh, you can buy, buy one, they take a lot of energy, but you've got it in your Xbox. Your Xbox has a GPU in it, it has 4,000 crackers <laughs> in it. Uh, your Nvidia card, uh, will quite happily crack this type of thing. It's a really easy thing for them to do. They just keep trying to crack until they actually find it. And we can build a whole big array of these things. In fact, we could take over the Amazon Cloud. Amazon have a service for GPUs in the cloud. I think it's the one cloud that's completely full. Everybody's using it to crack 
passwords and, and, and so on. So this isn't fast. We can go up to a terahash a second for our Bitcoin miners. So 100 billion per second isn't really a very fast, uh, but we'll see if we're secure. So tell me where you think we're secure. Is the first one secure? Second one? Third one? Third one. Third one. You think we're not secure for the first two, and then the second one is second one isn't secure uh, either. So what we'll do is we'll we'll just run our encryption again. Let's find our password strength. Okay, so I've set up a little a little calculator here. Uh, did we say ten billion? So we're going to do ten billion cracks per second and and let's do it as a parallel processing machine let's say we've got a, 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 an NVIDIA GPU so it's got 4000 cores in it and we're going to go for A to Z so oh boy <laughs> so if we use A to Z it's going to take uh, uh, my ISP gives me 8 Eight characters, I think. Uh, eight, eight to ten, ten characters. Ten characters. Every single password is cracked in three seconds. <laughs> On average, one and a half seconds. Three seconds to crack every single uh, password for lowercase a to z. Okay, so don't ever tell anybody to use just lowercase because they're cracked in an instance. So we'll now try big a to z. That's a bit better. So for our seven digits, 0 0.03 seconds. <laughs> 30 milliseconds will crack every single one of those passwords. So we'll add in 0 to 9, and we'll add in some characters in there, uh, in there and see where we get. So now it takes 0 0.1 second to crack seven digit passwords. OK, so we're all agreeing that that's not looking very good, is it? <laughs> So if we even add in 0 to 9, then it takes 0.3 seconds to crack every single... So if you use squiggly, smiley face, bleh, 5, 9, dollar, whatever, it's cracked almost in an instance. Only when we start to move here do you actually start to see any significance. There's the amount of passwords that there is. So with 10 digits, it's 1.3 uh, uh, days from there. Uh, so, and even if we took it right up, but if we did it with bcrypt, <laughs> bcrypt does 200 per second. You go, that's crazy. I want the best. But if we use bcrypt, uh, this is going to go mental, but uh, if I use bcrypt, <laughs> uh, then even my, my seven-digit password is going to take so long uh, to crack. So I'll go into more detail of what bcrypt does and what uh, the other really slow one does, but sometimes slowness is actually really good in, in security, and especially uh, in here. So there you go. It's going to take you a long time to, to crack that. Okay, so we'll go into more detail into hashing methods next week and how we use salt, uh, and that should give us a better understanding of password hashing. Thanks.